Good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you so much for coming to the Caregiving 101 program for the part as part of our Alzheimer's and Dementia series for this year. This is our final program for this year, and we will be starting up again next year in April. And we'll have some more information about those as soon as we can. And so for this program, uh, we have Robin Era, who will be coming in, um, who is a social worker, certified care manager, and a, a certified member of the Aging Life Care, oh, it was Aging care Center. Aging Life Care Center. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> and um, she will be explaining some um, different kind of basics about caregiving as well as some uh, questions you might be having if you're starting out with becoming a caregiver. And I'll hand it off to Robin Arrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Just to be clear, that's not where I work, so that's why I don't know what it is. <laughs> that's okay. I actually, I work for the Harpeth Hills Church of Christ in their Resource Center for Aging. And just a little bit about um, myself, I started out as a youngster at, I, I've run the gamut, so I worked for the state. I started out in Child and Adult Protective Services, then went into uh, medical home health, took a 15 years off to stay at home with my daughter and then came back into non-medical home health. And from there, I met a gentleman who brought me into the church and said, every church needs a social worker to help work with the families. And that's where I've been. I worked at the church for 11 years on a contract basis. And it just happened that last year, um, their senior minister, meaning the minister who ran the senior program, retired and they asked me if I wanted to step into that role. So now I'm actually on staff at Harpeth Hills. Um, I am over programming as far as the senior ministry goes. I do a lot of education. I think there's so many things that folks do not know that they don't need to know until it happens. And then it's a panic of who do I ask, where do I go? A lot of people think, well, we'll go to the church. Well, in a typical church situation, nobody knows. They might have heard something, but they really don't know or they don't know where to send you. So I am that person. And I am not only for Harpeth Hills, anybody in the community is welcome to call me and ask questions. And what happens a lot of times, and we all know this, it's Friday afternoon at four o'clock and nobody's working, but I am. Call me. <laughs> I got a call Saturday night. I was at a fall party at 745 and it's always, I'm so sorry to bother you. I'm thinking, no, you're not. It's 745. What can I do with my mom right now? So luckily I was there with a few other social workers. We got our heads together and said, this is what you need to do. So that's what I do. I also do um, a Sunday school class every winter quarter of uh, what you don't know that you need to know as far as aging. So I do help with resources going forward. I don't tell you where to go, but I will tell you given your certain situation where I think you need to go um, based on your income, where you live, where your uh, family is, things like that, your acuity. A lot of people don't understand the different levels and we're gonna talk about that today. So it's not one, place fits all. So once I get your information, I can guide you. You know, if your income is not very high, I'm not going to send you to the most expensive place in Nashville. If your family lives in Spring Hill, I'm not going to send you to Nashville because that's a long trek for your family to go. So it's a lot that goes into that. Um, most recently, and one of the things that I love more than life itself is I have started with several other people with Sunny Day Club. I don't know if any of you've heard about that. It was started through um, Brentwood United Methodist here. And on Thursdays, every Thursday, Larry's a part of it. He has been huge help for me. Uh, we bring in some members and we entertain them for three hours while their caregivers have respite time for three hours for a dollar. 
and we have the best time. I'm telling you, the volunteers have more fun than the members do. And we laugh and we have a great time. And then they go back with their caregivers. The caregivers can go home and sleep. They can go home or go out and shop. They can do whatever they want to do during that three hours. We've got one lady that drives in from Spring Hill. And I remember saying, there's no way. Why would you do that? Why would you drive in all this way for three hours? They come faithfully. She needs that time. So that's, that's my newest idea that we're doing. I have many more for next year. When they brought me on, they were being funny and said, what do you want to do with this program? And they all just sat back and looked at me and they thought, mm -hmm, it's all been done. I have a new year coming up. So I'm excited. Anyhow, um, how many of you in here are caregiving right now? Okay, and the rest of you are headed into it or um, have been there. I, uh, my journey, just real quickly, my father, I, a caregiver, I was a caregiver for him, but he was always sick. I don't ever remember my dad not being sick. He passed when I was young, and then my caregiving ended with my mother. So a lot of times when I talk, I will say she, because she was my uh, most difficult person to care for. And she's the one I learned the most with. And let me tell you, I did every single thing wrong. So I'm here to hope that you don't do it and show you the difference of when it goes right and when it's wrong. Uh, that was in Pennsylvania. And um, it's okay if you do everything wrong because none of us do it right. And it's okay because you did the best you could. And that's the one thing I want you all to remember, no matter what happens in a day, you're a good caregiver because you showed up. And sometimes that's all we can do, but we continue to show up. Okay, this is just real quick about caregivers, and I'm sure you've heard all kinds of statistics and everything. Um, over 11 million United, in the United States, adults are providing caregiving for someone with dementia. That's unpaid caregiving. So that means it's typically a family member. Of course, it's typically a woman. It is um, typically somebody who is 65 years or older, which means it's typically for a spouse. And it's usually about four years or more. 18.4 billion hours is how long it takes to care for someone with dementia in totality. Nearly one third of the family caregivers for people with Alzheimer's care for somebody with dementia and that adds up to four years. It is 77% of people, spouses, typically, who care for their loved ones that will predecease the person they're caring for because they do not take care of themselves. What percent? 77%. So that's you don't take the time to eat. You don't take the time to go to the doctor. You're not sleeping. You're not taking care of you. So that's really something you need to think about. And so often you'll talk to somebody who's caregiving and they'll brush you off. I need to take care of him. I can't do that right now. So if we don't take care of ourselves, it's the old oxygen, oxygen drops down in the airplane, put it on the child first or put it on yourself first and then put it on the child. That's what we need to keep in mind when we're caring for somebody. So have you heard of the sandwich generation? Well, now we're talking about the panini generation. Panini, do you know what a panini is? So a panini is a sandwich that you press down and make it sort of like a grilled cheese. So the cheese is coming out. Well, the sandwich generation is when you have, for instance, a daughter who is taking care of their parents 
and somebody under the age of 18 in their home. Well, now a lot of the parents are also taking care of the grandparents who are in the home are taking care of maybe their spouse, their grandchild, and their family, their daughters. So now it's the Panini generation. We've got everybody at home. Because of housing, we're all living together. We're all taking care of everybody. So typical caregiver duties, shopping, food preparation, housekeeping, laundry, transportation, doctor's visits, and giving medicine. That's typical household everyday things. That's what we do when we're taking care of somebody. And it may be not all, all at once. It, it, continue, it grows, it happens. I think a lot of times the things that we see first, money. And a lot of, especially with dementia, that's when people start discovering that something might not be right. You might be going out with a friend to lunch and they can't calculate the tip or they can't calculate what the bill is. Lots of ladies we find out when they play bridge, the person who kept score all the time no longer can keep score. They can't figure it out. So it's different things like that that start coming along or going into the doctor's visits and they come back, what'd they say? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, they said everything's fine. I'm just fine. Everything's good. Do you know how many times I heard that? And then I would go into the doctor's appointments and she'd say it and I'd sit behind her because I didn't want to embarrass her. And I'd go. <laughs> and the doctor would say, hmm. And I'd say, well, mom, how about your back? Is your back hurt? No, it's just fine today. And the doctor would then be able to go on and probe. You know, they're always just fine. They don't want anybody to think that there's anything wrong with them. So instrumental activities of daily living. These are the skills that most people need, have to have to live independently. So they're driving or they're able to call Uber, a taxi, get on the bus, do something to be able to go across town. They can prepare their own meals, whether that be from scratch or they can heat something up in a microwave. Um, they can use the telephone, they can manage their own medicines, and that's huge. Now, it may not be um, putting them in a pill pack, but they know which ones they're taking. So if they pull it out of the pill pack, my mom would say, oh, that one's not supposed to be in here. So they know the colors, they know what's going on. Um, you know, they can do the household stuff, the maintenance, doesn't mean they're doing it themselves, but they have the ability to call somebody. So they're still running their household. They still know who they can call if the roof leaks, things like that. So that is living independently. And then the financial responsibilities. Now some people, very few, will give up the financial responsibilities because they just don't want to do it anymore. Typically women, but the one thing I want to impress upon husbands and wives in here is that as you age, teach each other. Because a lot of times the women are the only ones that do the, the banking. I mean, my husband, he'd have no clue. He would have no clue what comes out, what goes in, who pays who. Teach each other. Learn that. Because if the memory goes or someone passes, they don't know that. So those are things that we need to learn as we go along. And then the ADLs, these are activities of daily living. And these are um, the activities for dependent living at home or in a community. These are the items that if you're thinking about moving into an assisted living, this is what the assisted livings are going to judge you by. So when a nurse comes out, if you're thinking about moving, a nurse will come out and do an evaluation. So they will want to decide if you are able to do these activities by yourself or if you have to rely on someone to help you with those activities. So they are bathing, personal hygiene and grooming, dressing, undressing, transferring, 
And transferring means from a wheelchair to the bed, a wheelchair to the toilet, chair to standing to the bed, um, toileting, if you're able to go in by yourself. If not, do you have to have something to help you, some of the um, incontinence underwear or things like that? And are you able to prepare food and feed yourself? So if you can meet those five criteria, you are not able to go into an assisted living. If there's, if you, those things you're not able to do, they will consider you for an assisted living. In with that is also medicines. If you are not able to manage your medicines, you're not able to, you don't know uh, which medicines go where, you couldn't fill a pill pack, somebody has to do that for you. Somebody has to tell you when it's time. So this is the type of paid caregivers if it's above and beyond what you're doing at home. So you have the non-medical companies, you have the medical home health, and you have caregivers. And we're gonna talk about each of those and we're gonna talk about who pays for those because everybody automatically defaults to Medicare is gonna pay for all of those. Doesn't happen. Medicare doesn't pay for much. <laughs> so the caregiving services there are types of payments you have private pay which is typically who pays for it and that means you pay for it out of your pocket long-term care insurance and if you were very lucky you got that many many years ago and it's a beautiful policy and it'll pay for a lot Long-term care insurance now is not so wonderful. They don't pay for much. And if you have a policy and they keep upping your premium, pay it, don't drop it. You've paid it all these years, keep it up. Because I guarantee if you need it, it will help you along the way. And another thought about this, I always tell, you know, back to that, I'm good, I'm fine, I don't need help. My sister-in-law, her father had long-term care insurance. They had activated it and activated. it. Don't think I'm waiting for the next big episode. If something happens, activate it because most of them have a waiting period. So start your waiting period. She had activated his long-term care insurance. He was receiving long-term care insurance. Now the nurses will check in to make sure you still need it. She was not on the phone call. This man was in a walker, on oxygen, could not bathe, dress, feed, or cook for himself. How are you today, Mr. Krieger? Fine. Can you do these things? Oh yes, I can do these things. Okay, boom, cut him off. My sister-in-law called me in tears. I said, you call that company back and tell them his worst day. So anytime you talk to a nurse through a long-term care company, even though your loved one wants to say they're great, they're fine, talk about their worst day because that's what they're looking and they wanna cut you off. They don't wanna pay those long-term care insurance policies. So talk about the worst day, not the best day, not I can do everything. You've paid those premiums, that was your insurance policy do it, get the, get the benefits of that and do it early because so many people have passed on and never used those policies that they've paid into for years and years. And long-term care insurance, well, we'll go on about that, but they will pay for caregivers at home, they will pay for assisted living, and they will pay for nursing homes. So if you've got them, activate them as soon as you know you need it. Don't wait for the next episode because you're in that episode, no matter how big or small it is. Medicare, Medicare pays for your hospital stay and Medicare will pay for some rehab. Not much of rehab. <clears throat> Medicaid, duh with the D down there, <laughs> you have to qualify for. Caregiving grants, there are grants to be had out in the community. There is um, 
the Caregiver Coalition, Tennessee Caregiver Caregiving Coalition. They have vouchers. Anybody can get those. You don't have to qualify. You just have to show that you live in Williamson and Davidson County, and they are, I think this year, they're $600. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it pays for one day of 24-7 caregiving. So I urge you to sign up and get that voucher, and they will send you the voucher, and you can use that any way you want to for caregiving. VA benefits, if the person you're caring for was in the military, you can call in and see if they qualify. If they qualify, that's a stipend that goes on to hit the income and you use that for caregiving, whether it be in the home or in a facility. That is all, you have to qualify. There's all sorts of hoops you have to jump through. There's companies that can help you qualify for that. And then there's home and community-based services, which you also have to qualify for. It's a part of the 10 care programming, and you do have to qualify for that as well, both medically and financially. So the non-medical companies, they're all over the place. And they all pretty much do the same thing. The biggest thing you wanna make sure is that they're licensed and bonded. Because if anything happens when they're in your home, they will take care of it. They're available 24-7. They'll do the housekeeping, the meals, the bathing, the grooming, assistance to the bathroom, errands, transportation, and companionship. Now, they start at $32 an hour and they go up to about $40 an hour. That's a big chunk. And if you put that at 24 seven, that's a lot of money. So again, back to that long-term care, if you've got it, start it. Now, and most of them have a minimum. Most of them have a minimum between four and some of them five hours per day. Some of them had started doing the, you have to have so many hours per week. I think they found out that's not working very well. So they've gone back to the, the daily minimum. You can do a lot. People will say to me, I can't, four hours. I can't keep them busy for four hours. Actually, you can. If, if they're coming in to bathe somebody till they get them up and get them in there, that's probably a good two hours. Clean up the room, feed them something. Um, that could be, it can take up that time. What I will tell you is if you have a caregiver in your home, make a list. Don't assume that these folks are coming in and know what to do. Think about this. These people are coming into a stranger's home. They have no idea where your stuff is, what you expect of them. Make a list. They're coming in Monday. This is what I expect you to do on Mondays. They're coming in Wednesday. This is what I expect you to do on Wednesdays. So they know. The other thing is, you are welcoming a stranger into your home. And that's not comfortable either. And people will come in the first time that I, I don't like her. I'm not having her back. I encourage you to do at least two or three times. Now, I don't like everybody. I know that surprises you, Larry. <laughs> so I know you don't like everybody. And it doesn't matter why you don't like them. You just may have a different personality. If that's the case, call the company. They're used to it. Say, can you send me somebody else? She didn't do anything wrong. I'm just not comfortable. I had a lady, the girl didn't have straight teeth. She didn't want her in her home. We switched her out. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't matter why, but if you're not comfortable, why have them in your home? This is to help you. 
not make you cringe every time somebody shows up. So give them a couple days though, so you all get used to each other. And once you get into a routine, that is helpful. If you do more days a week, you're more likely to have the same person. Because a lot of people say, well, I'll just try it one day a week. That's fine, but I guarantee you, if you do one day a week, you're gonna get a different person every week because they're gonna pick the person who doesn't have anything to do that day. So I encourage you to do at least two times a week that you're gonna get the same person. And it's frustrating because now you are training the new person every time they come in your house. And it is annoying. So make a list, let them know what you expect of them. You are not there to entertain them. You are not there to visit with them. You are not there to feed them. You don't have to feed, um, invite them to your table if you and your loved one are having lunch. They don't get a lunch unless they're there longer than six hours. So they can bring whatever they have. They can sit in another room, whatever but they are there to do a job. You are the boss. The company is not the boss. You tell the company what you want. And I've heard it over and over. Well, Miss Arab, it would work better if our person came in seven to four. Well, my husband doesn't get up till 10. Well, it would just work better for us. Well, it wouldn't work better for me. And they push and push because that's what works better for them. You're the boss. You're paying them. If you can't fit, send me somebody at 10, I'll go with another company. They're all over the place. So remember also they're salespeople. They're going to sell you. They're going to tell you we're the best company. We do better than everybody else. Blah, 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 blah. And they may be. I'm not saying they're not. There's some great companies out there. So just keep all of it in mind. And you will know when you interview a company, you'll know how you feel. You, you'll get the feeling. I wouldn't interview more than three because they all do the same thing. Nobody's going to do your windows. Nobody's going to put extra effort into it. They're all only as good as their caregivers. So I would go with three companies, see how you feel. If you don't like a company, you're not stuck with them. They only make you sign. You do not sign a contract. It's just a letter of intent. So you can get out of that anytime you need to. So... Who do you call and find out? Well, are all of you uh, familiar with AgeWell and their directory of services? We don't have any of those books. I should have brought some. AgeWell used to be, if you are familiar with it, um, the Council on Aging, but you can go on their site. AgeWell, they have an interactive online directory. They also have directories that you can pick up at the library. And they're coming out with a new one next year. It's all the agencies that are in there. They're not in there because they advertise. They're in there because they're local agencies. Um, they also have a really cool tool at the back of, uh, in their website that you can put in where your loved one is right now. And it'll say, your loved one is ready for home care. Your loved one is ready for a nursing home. It's, it's like a five minute little check. I like it. It's, it's a Rubik's something or other. You can check there. Um, AgeWell also has a phone number that you can call and it's a 30 minute consultation with a case manager. If you have questions that they can answer those questions for you. Um, ask your doctor. Most doctors don't know. They know who came and marketed them, the names they've heard, but the nurses probably do. Nurses know everything. Um, meet and interview a few companies. And I always say interview the companies before the episode, because if you've had an episode and you're nervous and you got to get something done, somebody's got to come in tomorrow, 
you're not thinking straight. Interview them beforehand. You could get on people's rosters beforehand. You don't have to wait until something happens. You've met them, you've interviewed them, and you can say, hey, put me down. I'd like to, to know that I can call you if something happens. So you can do that as well. Ask your church, ask your friends, who have you used? Did you have good experiences? Did you have bad experiences? And that helps a lot. So then there's medical home health. Now, Medicare will pay for medical home health if your doctor orders it. And typically he will order it if you, when you're coming out of a hospital or something has happened, if you've had a decline and you call the doctor's office and say, hey, we need some physical therapy right now. So they will typically send an RN, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, social worker, um, sometimes a CNA. But here's the thing. Everybody thinks these folks come and you don't need in-home non-medical care. These people are in your home maybe an hour per visit. It's not long. Nurse comes in, takes your vitals, checks what you're doing, and out she goes. This is not care. This is to check that your health is going on okay. If the nurse says they no longer need my services, it's over. Everybody goes. The nurse or the PT, they're the two that lead it. So if one of those two decide that you no longer need the services, it's over and Medicare doesn't pay for it anymore. Also, you have to be homebound to get this. So if they have to chase you down because you're at the grocery store, services are done. If your sweet loved one says, I don't feel good today, you come back tomorrow. Okay, come back tomorrow. And I really don't wanna do it today. Come back tomorrow. Done. If you, if you refuse them, they're not coming back. So you got to push them to do it. And it, it's helpful. They need it. They need it to get their strength back to be at home. So it's one of those things, the more they refuse, it's going to be gone. So it's typically short term, usually two to three months, unless it's really something broken leg or something to that effect, broken hip, that they really need to be working on. And it can be longer. It can go on as long as the doctor signs the orders. If the doctor doesn't sign the orders, it ends. And that depends on the nurse or the physical therapist. Sometimes the physical therapist can come without a nurse and the nurse can come without a physical therapist, but they're the two leads. And again, those companies usually come from who the doctor works with. Um, if you're not happy with that company, you can request a company. You don't have to do who the doctor works with. You can pick any company that you want. So this is the one everybody likes. Well, what if I just hire somebody privately? This lady down the street, I heard she does it and she's a whole lot cheaper. Okay. That's probably true. Here's the downfall of that. Now you are responsible for her taxes. You are responsible for the insurance if she gets hurt in your home. There's no background checks. You can probably run one. If they call in sick, who's gonna come? You, you've now missed a day of work. At least in the company, they will have somebody come and cover. They'll send somebody else in. If it's one person, you don't have anybody to cover you. You do all the scheduling. That's not handed off to anybody else. So you have to do the puzzle of the scheduling. And the biggest thing is if they steal from you, you have no recourse. And a lot, I'm not that I was going to say a lot of them do. That's not true. Even, even the companies, 
people have been known to steal. I mean, people are people. It's going to happen. The companies, you have the recourse. Remember to be smart when you're in your home. Don't have things laying around that are tempting. Your ex expensive purses, your jewelry, things like that. But if you've got somebody private in your home, they're there much longer typically than a regular caregiver. They're going to be around the house more. It's just a little bit harder to keep somebody. I recently had a lady that she insisted, and I've been telling her for years, you don't want to do it, insisted, insisted. We hired a private caregiver. The caregiver was sweet as pie, but she drove us all nuts because she was as sweet as pie. She was just, oh, honey, baby doll, how are you feeling today? Everything good? And that went on for eight hours. You know, you can only take so much of that. Let's play a card game now. No, let's not. Um, and to the point that she was in a facility, and even the facility people came in and said, where'd Looney go? You know, so it's just, who do you have to fill in then when you get rid of Looney? You know, it's, it's different. It, you're just stuck in a position. A lot of people have hired privately and loved it. So I'm just giving you the precaution. Can you tell I'm not a caregiver? <laughs> <laughs> then we have care managers. Do you know about care managers? So care managers, um, they're expensive. I used one for my mom because I was not in Pennsylvania. Um, they are the daughter that takes care of everything. So they will call, they will set up all these things that we're talking about. You don't, you just pay them and they will take care of everything. They'll take your loved one to the doctor. They will do everything that they need to do as far as taking care of your loved one. So they can do all the planning, the problem solving. If you want them to call you, they will. If not, they'll just do all of it. They'll do the caregiver coaching. They do everything. Um, an assessment can be $500, and then depending on whether you use a nurse or a social worker, they will charge by the hour for that. I had them for about a month, and I think it was over $2,000. And not to say they didn't do their job, but my mother was clever, and I had them because she wasn't taking her medicines. She had a little system, you see that you rotate your pills in the desk drawer and that's how you take them, okay? So the nurse went in and said, oh my goodness, the pills were a mess. So I straightened them all up and then she had all these extra pill bottles in the next drawer and she said, your mom told me she was gonna take care of that. And I said, oh, well, good. So my mom knew that you weren't supposed to throw the pills out. So her method was that you take all those pills, you boil them, and then you throw them over the, the fence into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> That's how you take care of your pills. Okay. So the care manager came back next and said, um, hey, your mom got rid of those pills like she told me she would. I said, she did. Yeah, where, where did she put them? She, and she told that whole story. Okay. I went up probably two weeks after that, every one of those pills were still in the drawer. Care manager never checked. She liked that story about the pills. She also froze her garbage in case it smelled. So I was like, mm. So you never know. They can be helpful. They can't be helpful. So, um, but they do take long-term care insurance. Yes, ma'am. You said something about um, hiring Yes. Now they will take um, long-term care insurance and um, it's helpful for long distance caregivers. So this aging life care association, <laughs> they have a website and they have a list. And so you can see the credentials of the folks that are on and that I would encourage um, to get on that website and you can read their credentials and you can then get onto their personal websites. And so I would look, and actually, the lady who owned this company, it had her credentials. The lady who I worked with was not the owner. 
So she was, um, I don't, I'm not sure what she was at that point, but um, you can see who you're working with. They are companies and they're companies? They, they, most of them own their own companies. Now there are some that have, that work for companies, but most of them own their own companies. And they're well versed in what they need to do. And most of them have been there for a very long time. And they have to go through the certification that I have. We all have to continually go through that certification every three years, improve education and everything as we go. So it, if you have the income to do it, it's a good thing to do. So we'll go through the uh, facilities. So you have an independent housing, adult daycare, assisted living, long-term care, and memory care. So independent living, you're either living at home in a 55 up community or a buy-in facility. And a lot of the facilities here no longer do the buy-ins. There's a couple that do, but for the most part, um, independent living in this area now, you can pay month to month rent, which is much nicer because if you move a level, you don't have to stay there. You're not selling your home a lot of times to get into that home because with the buy-ins, you do have to sell your home because the buy-in could be um, seven, dollars $800,000 to get into it. 55 and up communities, they're just as buying a condo or anything like that. And then um, it's just like your own home. So adult daycares, there's a few here. There's 50 forward. There is um, Centennial Downtown. Abe's Garden has one now. Some of the facilities, some of the assisted living facilities do provide some adult daycare. The Sunny Day Clubs, we're now in four churches that um, provide that three hours care. Take your loved one there. They can spend the day there. They get lunch. They get exercise. It's socialization. The key is socialization with a lot of folks. And a lot of people will say, I, my loved one wants to stay home. Well, we all want to stay home, right? That would be our druthers. But what people don't understand is they need to be socialized. There's a huge difference. When we see some folks at home and then they move into a facility, the socialization is what they need. Now, not everybody. I mean, some people will still stay in their rooms and such, but socialization is huge. Can you just clarify what you just said there about you see a huge difference? Yes, like that? that they become active. Mm -hmm. They but smile, they active. yes. Yeah. If they're at home, they're watching TV usually, yeah. or they're sleeping. Well, if they move into a facility, whether they join in the activities or not, they may just be sitting there, they're surrounded by people. Things are going on. Everybody's eating at the table together. So, you know, so many people say, oh, my mom would not like that. And you show up and they're down batting the balloons with somebody. You know, it's, it's a, remarkable to see the difference in them. We have a lady at Sunny Day. She is grumpy. Last week she stayed in there with her eyes closed. But she sat there with her eyes closed the whole time. But she will still join in. She doesn't want to be there, she says, but she joins in. She opens her eyes and eats her lunch. So, <laughs> so then there's your assisted livings, 24-hour care, the medicines, the meals, the transportation, personal care activities. Um, medical care is on site. The deal is you have to be able to exit of your own accord in 13 minutes. So that along with those ADLs that we talked about earlier, you have to be able to get out or you have to be able to get to an exit that somebody can help you get out that from the facility. A word about this, when you do the assisted livings, I always tell folks when you go in and remember these, these people are salespeople too. And all the facilities are pretty much the same, just like the caregivers. They're all pretty. And you walk in and you think, wow, this is great. 
and then you find out maybe it's not so great. Again, they're only as good as their caregivers. The things you need to know about the assisted livings, how they charge. Do they bundle or do they charge you by item? You want to go with a bundle because if you start out, they'll say, oh, our, our rates are so good. So-and-so down the street, they're charging $5,000. We only charge you $3,000. Oh, we'll move in here. It's so much cheaper. You move in at $3,000. A month later, mom now needs help with her laundry. Oh, $5,000 or $500 more. Oh, mom now needs help with a shower. Oh, $500 more. And you keep going till the end of the year. Now you're at 5,000, 6,000 that you weren't expecting, that you didn't budget for, you didn't plan for. So you always want to see what you're getting. So it might look great on paper that this is 3,000. This one's 5,000, but it included everything. You may not use everything right now, but you know what you're going to get. Most of them don't cover cable or telephones. Um, everything else, if they bundle it, is there. They do have doctors, medical directors that are on site, so your loved one can use that person or they can stay with their primary care. They always have podiatrists come in, different doctors that come in. I say use those people, why, why drag them out to a doctor? unless you just really want to be with that doctor, I would stay with them. Blue skies, um, house, calls. house calls, they come to the facilities, you know, use those people. This is private pay, all private pay. And those will run from 3,000 to 5,000, depending where you're, where you're going. And then you have the long-term care, which is what we use, a skilled facility, which is what most of you probably think of as a nursing home. That it looks like a hospital. I had one lady, I could not get her to understand that she was in a long-term care. She kept saying, well, it's not a nursing home. Yes, ma'am, it is. <laughs> it is a nursing home. So it's a licensed facility where they have more care. So if um, you need to be on IVs, if you're on a feeding tube, different things like that, this is where you would go. If you're bedridden and you can no longer walk and you need extra help, it is a hospital setting. It is what the old nursing home that we think about, but it's not Nurse Ratchet's nursing home. It is much nicer, well, it's nicer, <laughs> but it is a hospital setting. That is also where you go for rehab. Most, hosp or most nursing homes will have a special section for rehab. So you go in that area, that's where you will stay to get your PT and exercise after you leave a hospital. And depending on how long your rehab takes, that's where, you're, where you will stay and then you go home. Some people will go to rehab and then leave and go to assisted living instead of going back home. It just depends on your condition and what your family chooses for you to do. Medicare will pay for the rehab part. Medicare does not pay if you're there long term. And then there's memory care. So most facilities are independent, assisted living, and memory care. Memory care is not like a nursing home. It, it, it looks, it has beds, hospital beds in them. It is significantly more, it is smaller, and it is a lockdown unit, so people who wander cannot come out. But they do have areas where they can walk, they have gardens, they have things for the folks, maybe things um, that look from back in their time when they were younger. So it's decorated for them specifically it's safer for them, won't have as many chairs and things that you would normally see 
in the regular assisted living area. The ratio patient to caregiver is smaller, and these caregivers have spe special dementia training. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, what's the definition of wandering? I'm trying to leave the building. The building, not the not a room, but the building. Itself. The building, right. Okay. Yeah. And they can still, in that area, they can still go into other people's rooms, but they cannot get outside. They cannot escape the building. Unless they follow somebody out, and there's usually codes to get in or get out. Okay. So as soon as they leave, that's risk right. Or they'd be to right. Okay. And um, and some people just don't do well in that have dementia in the bigger assisted living area. So they may be moved to the memory care as a trial basis. Um, not really a good idea because those people typically are more advanced, but it may work. It may not. Those are rooms, but they're a little bit bigger, so they may have chairs in them, their own TV. I've seen people have little kitchen tables there, maybe their favorite um, recliner, mm -hmm. things yeah. like that. They have a mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's probably um, like a large hospital room, maybe. Medicare so, <laughs> No Medicare. You're looking at, you're bumping it up to about 8,000. So these are some of the ratios, and these are really, this is, this is not what you're getting, but this is what you should be getting. So when you're checking in a caregiver one to seven would be great. Typically what you're getting is one to 10 assisted living, one to 15, one caregiver to 15 people. So do people go in and find this out for sure, or is this just what? I encourage you to. I encourage you to go in it. No, this, this, yes, this was somebody who went in and did his work. I mean, he went in and said, this is what he, he researched it. This is what we're supposed to have. Now, the one thing, especially in assisted living, the question you want to ask is, is there an RN on the premises 24 hours a day? They're going to tell you no. They have, typically have an RN till 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock on, it's an LPN. Now, I'm not saying anything about LPNs, but they don't have the education that an RN does. So if there's an emergency overnight, then the question is, does the LPN have access to an RN to get an answer? If they say yes, okay. But what you really want for them to say is there's an RN around the clock. Now there are RNs in memory care. There's always an RN in memory care around the clock. But that's really what you want to hear is that there's an RN all the time there. In assisted living. In assisted living. I think this is way off. Oh, it is. I think this is you are correct. Off. You are correct. In, in reality, my sister worked for me. Oh, yeah. And I know. You are correct. And the weekends, it's even worse. With this shortage, you are getting, I mean, there, you can't get caregivers to work, number one, and they are stretched. And the horror stories that I have heard, and, and what's really sad, people will call me and I'll say, I'm sorry, but this is reality. It really is. It's, it's very sad. Um, and that's where... When I have families call me, I mean, the same thing, they're coming out of, of the hospital. The social worker walks in, says, here's your list. 
It's alphabetical. It's 100 rehab facilities. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Tell me where you want to go. Pick three. What do you know? You know, if I was in another state, what would I know? That's when you call me and say, what do I do? You have no idea. So that's when I get the little bit of information where you are, pick these, pick these. And then they might be full. So then you have to pick these, pick these. And what's the lesser of the evils? So that's when you find somebody who knows and you're welcome to call me and say, what can I do? Because we don't know. And it's horrible. You know, there's a couple in my head, which I won't say on camera, <laughs> that I will tell you never, never to go to, no matter what. But it's, you just don't know. You have no idea where you're going. And why would you? Why would you know? Because you didn't have any reason to know until now. But you're right. It's. It, it, it's bad. And the more you visit, it's just like when your children were in school and you showed up at the elementary school, showed your face, and they know you're coming. At different times, you drop in. You don't show up at the same times. You visit, and know, they know that you're there. The other thing is we've got a lady that they know her people were there, so they don't come in. I went in one day and somebody didn't show up and they said, oh, I said, she needs a bath today. Her person didn't show up. We don't have time for that. Excuse me? We're paying you $11,000. You make the time to give her a bath today. You know, it's that type thing that is frustrating. So we've got to be kind, but yet, this is my person, and you're going to take care of her. So if we don't do that, who is? So that is, um, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, that's what I have, and I know it's a lot. And, I, and please take my card. Feel free to call me anytime. And I just want people to learn that I don't want people to be taken advantage of. I want you to know going in, there's the way to do it and to have your person taken care of. I don't know what people who don't have somebody, you know, there's older folks that they have no family left. I don't know what those folks do. And it's sad when they can't hear or can't understand what's going on. So if we can get in there and educate ourselves and educate our friends and just make it a, the best of a bad situation that everybody has. So you. you're welcome. Thank you.